Well, again, you honor me to invite me here and then keep humbling me each day when you read off the list of those I follow. But nonetheless, I'm very happy to be here. I've had a great day with the very invigorating sessions with Dr. John Nab, McNabb and then some very cordial and uh, fine fellowship and then even finding my wayward suit bag that uh, didn't just, uh, hasn't reached me yet, but I hope it will soon because these are beginning to smell just a little bit. <laughs> So, and I'm very glad that my wife insisted I wear something rather than my old baggy sweater uh, since my bag got lost. You have treated me very kindly. I couldn't help in talking about Britain some. I preached once in the Baptist Church in Dover, which was quite an experience, principally because it was in an old church built years back. It looked like the Middle Ages, but I don't know the exact date. Uh, the thing that intrigued me no end was the very, very small pulpit up in the corner that you entered via a little passageway in the back, but they didn't use. And I asked why they didn't use it, and they told me, well, there was a time when we used to use it, but at one time we didn't have a minister. We invited in various preachers. One we invited we knew by name only, and he didn't come. The service started, the deacons began the service, they sang this hymn and then that hymn, and uh, one of the deacons was busily looking up something in scripture just in case, and just before the time for the scripture, the man came only to find that he was a very obese gentleman, and they couldn't get him up the stairs. <laughs> and the practice was to always preach from that pulpit, so the beetle got out a ladder, and in front of everyone, he climbed up into the pulpit, only there to get there in time to read his text, which unfortunately was John 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that climbeth up entereth not by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. <laughs> which of course meant that was the end of the use of that pulpit. <laughs> Nobody could ever keep a straight face and still hear me messages from that pulpit. You've treated me much better though tonight and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Maybe you had pl other plans and took one look at me, but nonetheless I thank you for the space. Now I would like tonight, since I realize that I'm not addressing or giving a learned address speaking to the Guild of New Testament Scholars, but rather an exposition on 1 Corinthians 15. I really would feel very badly if we talked all about but never read the passage. And so I would like not to start at the first verse where uh, we talked about that last night somewhat, but I would like to start with the first of the three sections following verse 11 and read tonight, before we begin, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 34. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since the dead, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come 
when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until God has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include Christ himself who put everything, pardon me, this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now if there's no resurrection of the dead, what will those who are baptized, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. We noted last hour, last night, that Christians at Corinth were experiencing a number of problems in their lives, probably as hangovers from their former experience and ways of looking at things. And there are in the Corinthian letter, 1 Corinthians, a number of such issues dealt with, and we enumerated many of those in the first 14 chapters. There is, however, this further matter in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul deals with, which evidently was also a problem at Corinth, and that is the fact, the nature, and the necessity of the resurrection. For Paul, he's prepared to base everything on the resurrection. For the resurrection supports and explains, looking back, the death of Christ and supports and guides and directs all of our Christian life looking ahead. But those at Corinth evidently were not so prepared to base everything on the resurrection. Evidently for them, they have a static view of life and of God's working. They might even have an ecstatic view of the Christian life. And as we mirror read Paul in 1 Corinthians, I suggested last time that they probably said the resurrection was irrelevant since the eschatological hope of the Christian had already been fulfilled in their lives, that the resurrection it was impossible since the material or physical aspects of life really don't enter into redemption in a Greek view, and that the resurrection of believers is unnecessary since by creation we possess an immortal soul and by redemption a redeemed soul and what more is there that God can do in our lives. And so Paul speaks to them directly where they are and I'd like tonight to address our attention to that of the verses we have read, verses 12 through, 20, through uh, 34, where Paul deals with an apologetic that uh, is somewhat involved, but nonetheless he makes his point. He deals then with an apocalyptic section where he begins to spell out the nature of the Christian hope and then gives some ad hominem appeals with appended uh, exhortations. And I would like to just go through the material with you. Uh, ultimately, Paul is arguing in 1 Corinthians 15 that our hope for the future is based upon Christ's hope. He has what I call a functional Christology. There is indeed an ontological Christology that's spelled out later in the New Testament and developed more and more, but at first he's talking in functional ways on the basis of Christ's resurrection and what that means for us in our resurrection. May I suggest that throughout the New Testament the writers work from what I call a functional Christology to their understanding of God for instance revealed by nature, revealed in the Old Testament 
but primarily revealed in the revelation in Jesus Christ. Or what they know about man, for example. Certainly biological uh, studies, historical studies, psychological studies can tell us a great deal about humanity. And yet, uh, as we measure ourselves against the person of Christ, uh, we come to understand something more about ourselves. And also in regard to death and life beyond. And so Paul's argument is in the first 12, in the verses 12 to 19, that to deny Christ's resurrection, pardon me, to deny the resurrection, is really to have implications regarding Christ's resurrection. Verse 13, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. For if one denies facticity and the possibility and the relevancy, then one is impinging upon the very basis of Christian faith. And to deny Christ's resurrection, Paul argues, is to make the gospel and faith in the gospel quite meaningless, to discredit the apostolic witness, and ultimately to leave one who confesses Christ still in one's sin, hopeless, lost, and he even says to be pitied. For we have, he says, if you deny the resurrection, have a very frail bark on which to, or boat on which to embark. Indeed, Paul is saying, stress the existential, the personal, the present, the immediate, all of that relevance of the Christian gospel. And yet God is also the God of the future, and Paul would lift his readers and his converts' eyes to see more than that. It was Edward Carnell, long deceased, who once said that present relevance without future hope is like boarding a ship for a transatlantic crossing without the assurance of ever arriving at port or disembarking. It is, of course, possible to live life to the full while on such a ship, even to extract meaning from the events of the passage, but with no assurance of ever reaching port or disembarking, there is something of a shadow cast over the entire voyage. How much better both a profitable trip, even if it be a banana boat or a cattle barge or Noah's Ark or whatever, uh, and the expectation of a safe harbor. Or as Henry Van Dyke once said, I don't know if you read the story of the other wise man in uh, Christmas time, it's a beautiful little story, but as he puts words in the mouth of that fourth wise man, Artaban, uh, the other wise man, quote, religion without a great hope would be an, like an altar without a living fire. Hope for the race and hope for posterity, ah, uh, but there's still much lacking if there is not also hope for the individual, for the person, for ourselves. Paul argues in the apologetic section there that it is vitally important that there be resurrection and to deny the individual's resurrection is also to deny the resurrection of Christ and to leave one without hope and without faith and futile life. We are oftentimes asked in philosophy or in argumentation, what one thing would there be to deny your position? What would it take to overthrow your stance? And if one answers nothing, well then it's possible that you don't have a reason position at all. It might be you have a superstition. Uh, we all have to come to bedrock and we all have to say, what is there that, if taken away, would cause me to take another course? And Paul says, if one is to deny the resurrection, with implications for Christ's resurrection, then we might as well, as he says, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Make the most of this life. For Paul, the resurrection was vitally important. Paul goes on in verses 20 through 28 to now lay out an apologetic section, or let me try again, an apocalyptic section. Uh, he now begins to speak in terms of 
what will take place as he begins to lay out uh, the scenario. It is apocalyptic, but more than that, it's an expression of God's sovereign reign that has been anticipated in the resurrection of Christ. Now, as we suggested last time, and would like to suggest again, though, next hour, I'd like to take some time to go through a number of passages, but there is a general hope in regard to the future in the Old Testament. There's a hope for the nation, certainly at least in such passages as Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14, the dry bones. I doubt myself that that's a resurrection passage for individuals, but it certainly talks in terms of the nation being brought together. Uh, there's also that very difficult passage in Isaiah 26, 19, your dead will come to life, their corpses will rise, awake, exalt, all of you who lie in the dust, for your dew is a radiant dew, and the land of ghosts will give birth. But I personally myself doubt that that's a great resurrection passage, though I know there are those who see that as one. It seems to me that that is speaking indeed very much like uh, Ezekiel 37 in terms of the nation, but it might have some relevance to individuals as well. There is thus that great hope in the Old Testament for the nation, and oft times language that is resurrection language is used in regard to the nation and the stirring up and the rising up of the nation. But there are suggestions, at least, in regard to the individual. Uh, I think of passages like some of the Psalms, where you get an emphasis on continued relationship with God that even death will not break, and the hope that there will continue such a relationship. Psalm 26, 9 to 11, Do not let my soul share the fate of sinners, or my life the doom of men of blood. I live my life in innocence. Redeem me, Yahweh, take pity on me. The cry, not like other people. Or in Psalm 45, 15, Sheol, talking about the unrighteous, is the home for them. But God will redeem my life from the grasp of Sheol and will receive me. Or Psalm 73, 23 to 28, I look to no one else in heaven. I delight in nothing else on earth. And it goes on, his flesh and his heart being pining with love and established on God. Those who abandon you are doomed. You destroy the adulterous deserter. Whereas my joy lies in being close to you, O God, I have taken shelter in the Lord continually to proclaim what you have done. Now, the passages are not telling us anything about a certainty about the future, but there is that hope that continued relationship would exist all throughout one's existence, and they would not be like the wicked. Uh, as uh, Robert Martin Ackard says, uh, for the psalmist, the God of his people is all his joy. To live in his fellowship is security for tomorrow as it is for today. To depart from him is to be doomed to disappear. And to draw near to the living God is a privilege of which he does not foresee the end. Yahweh fills the whole mind and heart. And in face of his faith, death seems to withdraw. Or at least to lose its power to harm. And I suggest that that's also the consciousness that underlies Jesus' argument with the Sadducees, as mentioned last night in Mark 12, 26, and 27, and its parallels in the other Synoptic Gospels, where in arguing with the Sadducees, Jesus said, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he drew from that, that thus God is not the God of the dead, but of the living when God establishes relationship with the patriarchs. He is not thus continuing relationship with dead ones, but uh, with living ones. The particular exegesis is built on the present tense of the verb, but the consciousness that underlies it is that which talks about a continuing relationship with God that is not broken even in death. And perhaps, and probably I would say, in Daniel chapters 12, chapter 12, 1 and 2, you get something of a hint of resurrection. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise and talks about distress. 
And at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. But that suggestion and that hope is towards the end of the Old Testament. And uh, I would like to suggest next hour as we talk about how that was visualized and how Paul visualizes it as he goes on to say how is it possible, I'd like to suggest that, that was variously elaborated in the intertestamental period or the period of Second Temple Judaism. For Paul, though, he begins to talk about this hope that is rooted in the Old Testament, at least with some uh, basis but not uh, developed, and begins to spell that out in ways that are apocalyptic. Now, apocalyptic, for some uninitiated, is more than just eschatology. Eschatology, eschatos, is talking about the future or the end. Apocalyptic is beginning to talk about things in terms of relationships, spelling things out, putting things in order. Cryptic symbolism is used. Visions, imagery. The prophets received their message by vision but proclaimed it. The apocalyptic writers receive it but proclaim it in visionary form. There are many other differences, but at least this. That the apocalyptic writers are attempting to, as it were, organize knowledge, work things out in ways that are understandable. I think that uh, that is because uh, there is, in the mindset of the world at that time, and Greek mindset not taking over the Hebrew world, but at least influencing the Hebrew world, there's the endeavor to put things now in organized fashion. The Jewish world just likes to say that, 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 and uh, sometimes you have to worry about how to put it all together, and, and, and. Uh, the Greek mind likes to put it all together logically and temporally, and so the Greek language even is very, very difficult to learn, but easy to work out. Hebrew, may I suggest, is easier to learn because it's not so highly inflected, uh, but uh, very hard to understand. <laughs> you have many more other possibilities because the relationships aren't spelled out. But in the Jewish world of at least the third century BC, there and throughout the Greek world, as the Greek world is penetrating many other places, there is the desire for what could be called encyclopedic knowledge how to organize things in ways that are more encyclopedic, or if I could say it in another way, the intellectualization of piety. Uh, now, with uh, the Greek mentality coming in, you're beginning to say, now how do I understand my Jewish piety in ways that are understandable? Uh, there begins to be the focus more on the individual begins to be more the emphasis on cause and event, or causes and effects, rather, and then also on uh, particular events and how they line up. Paul is a product, as are all the Jewish people of the first century, of that whole background. And it is inevitable that they should begin to think now in terms of what does it mean for the person. I, as I said last night, and I won't keep repeating that, but. Uh, uh, I was very interested to note in some museums and various places in Israel uh, on the ossuaries no longer an emphasis just on gathered with the fathers and family names, but now even personal names, individual names. There is beginning to be a focus more on the individual. So Paul begins to spell out what that hope means. He uses, may I suggest, three words here around which we can build the discussion and around which I believe he builds it. Uh, in verses 20 and 23, the word first fruits, ap arche. Later he then will talk about the word parousia in verse 23, coming or presence. And then in verse 24, we'll talk in terms of telos, end. And I would like to build the uh, apocalyptic discussion here around those three words. 
Our, at RK, first fruits, parousia, coming or presence, and then telos, end. He tells us in verses 20 and 23, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Or again in verse 23, but each in his own order or turn, Christ the first fruits. Christ the first fruits. Let me say what probably seems to be the obvious, but uh, first fruits in Scripture have to do with those things that are either from produce of the grain, or the firstborn of animals, or the firstborn of humans, or uh, in the Talmud, the Jewish writings, they speak also of figs that produce first a woody, pulpy affair, and then the figs. They call the first thing that produce is the first fruits. First fruits in the Old Testament and in the Jewish world had to do were those that were sacrificed unto God and given to God. They didn't give uh, to God that which was left over after the harvest. They gave to God that which came first. And the first fruits thus were dedicated unto God. They sanctified all that followed and gave promise of fruitfulness. If there were no first, first fruits, you had no expectation of harvest. Uh, I think this is probably the explanation given to be given to the story in Mark 11 where Jesus came and seen a fig tree in leaf, desired to find something to eat on it, but Mark tells us it was not the season for figs. And you scratch your head and you say, does Mark know more than Jesus at this point? Uh, why would he want something to eat? But uh, if you understand that there, he's talking here about the fig tree that sets out of, in March sometime a small prop of little knobs called Taj in Arabic, and uh, country people ate these, uh, much as we would eat cereal this in the morning without a great deal of expectation of nourishment except for the milk and the, the sugar we put on it, but it fills the stomach. Uh, so evidently Jesus was expecting to find the first fruits, even though it was not the season for figs. And not finding first fruits knew it to be an unproductive tree. But that little figure of first fruits, aparche, is used by Paul six or seven times and then twice else. Let me just illustrate by where else it is used and then bring it back to Paul at this section. Uh, for instance, the first converts in an area by Paul are called the first fruits. Romans chapter 16, verse 5, he speaks of a panatus as he is greeting various ones in the Roman church and calls him the first fruits, the aparche of Asia. Or in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, when he talks about, he mentions the house of Stephanus, and he calls that family the first fruits of Achaia. So these two areas, here are the first converts. The first that were dedicated unto God, that sanctified the whole mission, and gave promise of a much more fruitful mission to follow the first fruits. Perhaps he also is referring to this, using it this way in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, though there there is a textual problem whether we should read ap our case, which means from the beginning, or close up the space and call ap our case, uh, which means first fruits. Uh, but uh, we won't get into that, and it's really just a space there. I tend to think the space should be there, but nonetheless, uh, that might be a place where first fruits, if that be possible. He's calling the converts of Thessalonica the first fruits of the area. He also speaks of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.23. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The Holy Spirit he says, is given to the Christian in awaiting the coming final end, and it is the pledge, the Spirit is the pledge, or uh, that which is the down payment, of some, as some have called it, but rather that which is given to us that promises what will yet come. We are awaiting, but presently we have the first fruits, Romans 8.23. 
he can say in that discussion of Israel uh, in Romans 11:16, if the first fruits is holy, the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. I'm not going to here get into discussion of exactly what he means there. Uh, we could have four or five views, but I uh, only want to say he talks about the first fruits. And then, of course, he uses it in these two places, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23, which makes up his total six or seven. Uh, it appears outside of Paul's writings in James 1.18, when he talks, when James talks about believers, and he says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that, he might, that we might be aparkentina, a kind of, a sort of, first fruits. Uh, he's straining it just a bit, but he's saying, nonetheless, we are to be those who are the first fruits of all that God is doing. And in Revelation 14:4, and again, I'm not going to exegete this, the 144,000 are offered to God and to the Lamb as the first fruits, uh, with promise of what will yet follow. Paul's point here is that Christ is the first fruits. He has been dedicated unto God, he has sanctified all, and he has given firm promise of what will come. So Paul says, Christ is the first fruits, that which we have struggled for to try to understand, that which the Old Testament perhaps hints at in regard to life after death, that which the uh, Second Temple Judaism materials argue back and forth at great uh, extent, Paul says now we see prefigured or acted before us in the resurrection of Christ. He is the first fruits. And there is the first point as we talk in terms of the future, uh, focus on Christ, the first fruits. The second point that Paul makes is uh, in verse 23, uh, and afterward, then when he comes, those who belong to him, each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, afterwards at his coming, those who belong to Christ, parousia. The Corinthians had been caught up in the exuberance of the present, in the over-realized eschatology of the moment. Paul can say in another concern, another area, something similar, 1 Corinthians 4, 8, somewhat ironically, already you have all you want. Already you've become rich, you become kings, and that without us. How I wish you really had become kings, so that we could reign with you. It's irony, but nonetheless, he's reflecting their own attitudes. They have been believing that everything now is fulfilled in their lives, and probably believing that resurrection has already taken place in their conversion experience, and is to be interpreted spiritually, and that's all. In fact, they are so spiritual, you know, that in chapter 5 they can think of incest as something of spiritual liberty, Christian freedom. They are so spiritual that they're not going to be in chapter 7 contaminated by anything material, even in marriage. So they're going to live celibate lives in marriage, or at least some are. They are those who flaunt their spirituality one against the other. And some are calling some the weak, and others are calling some the eaters. And they're going back and forth in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Uh, they have a spirituality that flaunts decorum in all sorts of ways, particularly in the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. And they have a spirituality that they are quite sure is guaranteed by certain exuberant and obvious gifts of the Spirit that they want to hold to. But Paul is arguing that there is something of a process here, and we need to see it. Presently, we have the first fruits, but we await his coming until all is culminated. And so he's talking here about something of process. If you read Martin Luther on uh, the uh, liberty of the Christian, Luther talks about how there is a tension built in the Christian life between Christ's coming and Christ's second coming. And he who is will not admit that is a sophist. Uh, if you read someone like Oscar Kuhlmann, 
and others talk in terms of the two ages, this age and the age to come, when we live in the overlapping of the ages and the tension that that brings about. While we appreciate Christ the first fruits, and that's where we are now, we yet long for and wait for the time of parousia, when indeed things will take place that affect even resurrection. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians, the focus throughout is on, uh, the focus as the letter ends at least, is on uh, the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16.22, Maranatha in Aramaic, which means, O Lord, or Our Lord, Tha, come, uh, and we yet await. But there's a third word, and that third word is in verse 24, uh, where then the end will come, the telos. Uh, in Greek, there are uh, various words for then translated here. Aita, ipaita are equivalent almost. You can almost hear them. I won't spell them out. Uh, and they are used interchangeably. And then tote, then. Uh, Aita epaita here, though, I would suggest is not just synchron synchronous with uh, parousia, but is meant to be something more successive, though not, we are not told when. Uh, I think we can gain something of that when Paul in chapter 15, verses 5 to 7, just before this, says in regard to the appearances, Christ was seen of Cephas, Aita, afterwards, succession, by the twelve, Epaita afterwards by the 500 brothers at once, Epaita afterwards by James, Aita then by or afterwards by all the apostles, and then last of all by me. He sets a nice little succession there uh, that goes that way. We can see this as something of signaling some kind of the same time as parousia, uh, I think Paul means it to be in some form of succession, as Coleman argues, as Gerhardus of Voss argues, as many others have. But uh, Paul is not trying to tell us how soon the succession. He leaves all that. But that is his third word. And his third word is, then, in succession, after coming, there is that of end, finality. And then he uses the word tote, uh, and then, and he begins to set up what takes place. At that telos, then in verse 24, uh, he will, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until God has put all things under his feet. Uh, there is going to be a time then of taking all the antagonistic powers, rulers, authorities, and bringing them into subjection under Christ. The last enemy in all this is going to be that of death. In Paul's understanding, sin has successively brought death. Read, for instance, Romans 5, uh, and if you're not a Greek, you can at least hear it, the krima came, eis katakrima, unto something of judgment. Krima, katakrima are basically the same word. The, the preposition is just strengthening it. So translators have their problems as how to translate them, but nonetheless, there is something of succession. And then in Romans 8, you can begin to talk about how, but now being in Christ, there is no more katakrima, <laughs> No more judgment. And then he can go on in Romans 8 to say, and there will even be a time when God shall even deal with death and with all that the signal by Krima. There is a succession in which sin has brought about our sad state and a progression of all of that to where we are. And there is also in redemption a progression, dealing first with judgment, but then also in our life dealing progressively which will then finally be culminated at end, uh, there is something of progression. We who watch television, we who like magic, we want everything immediately. <laughs> uh, we can't stand progression. Uh, we want fullness now. 
and evidently the Corinthians wanted fullness now. But we are still those who live under death here and now. We are still those who experience, experience the awful problems of sin in the nation and sin in the world. And we are still affected. We can't get out from under that. God can aid us and strengthen us in it. But we aren't living in heaven. We are living on earth. We are still those who will suffer death. We are still those who will be affected by death. But the promise is that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. When God, when Christ will then deliver the kingdom to God the Father, he will then, having captured all the reign, will then present all of that to God the Father. And then Paul ends by saying, um, well, he also says, now when I say everything is put under him, I don't mean that God is put under him. I think Paul would say, oops, don't take me wrong there. Uh, rather, uh, that does not include God himself, but everything is put under Christ. And then when he has done this, the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all and in all. With the redemptive program completed, Paul says, if I may interpret very broadly, the functional arrangement set up to, the effect, to effect that redemptive program will come to an end. Or as Margaret Thrall says in a very excellent short commentary on 1 Corinthians, in talking about this passage, the messianic function of Christ will therefore come to an end. He will give back to God the Father the powers entrusted to him for carrying it out, and will present to God a universe throughout which his sovereignty, in which his sovereignty is perfectly established. So the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so thus the redemptive program coming to an end and in order that God may be all in in all. Ta panta all in pasen, in all. Uh, I know that uh, process theologians love that passage because it talks about how there is a process where eventually God will be fully complete, but I don't believe that that's really what Paul is talking about, but rather that God's purposes culminated and God's reign finally established, then all will be culminated in God. And the redemptive purposes having come to an end, uh, all will be then finalized. I remember reading John Calvin once in the Institutes, and uh, while I don't cite Calvin for every point, yet I was amazed at his comment at this point, where he suggested that this passage indicates that the redemptive program has certain functions. So we know God as creator, we know God as Redeemer. We don't know what else God does in the multitude of things, but we know those two areas. When those uh, various things are completed, then the functions that were pertinent to those purposes being completed, then there will no longer be those functions operative. There will be much else we don't know of, and uh, we will find out perhaps in eternity, but uh, those functions will come to an end. God will be all in all. I think this is Paul's way of saying that which God had purposed for the redemptive purposes will now come to an end and God will be all in all. Paul thus argues, Corinthians, don't just take the Christian hope in static ways or even in ecstatic ways. Don't just see it all experientially realized here and now but rather come to understand that there is a process. Come to understand that now we know the first fruits. We look forward to the parousia, and afterwards we are assured of the end. And we can rest in that confidence, and we can live in that confidence. Thus view your lives in that kind of a layout of time. I must also go to these ad hominem appeals and then the exhortations and say something about it, but I want to come back to the main point he is making in the apocalyptic section. For he goes on to say, well now, if there is no resurrection, as some of you are saying, what will those who are baptized for the dead do? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Again, may I read Margaret Thrall? 
I think she has a, as pertinent comment as I could make on it. Why do some people receive baptism for the dead? It is uncertain what this practice was. I wish I knew. Perhaps some members of the congregation underwent further baptisms on behalf of friends or relatives who had in, received instruction in the Christian faith but died before they themselves were baptized. If there was no real future existence, how could they possibly benefit in any way at all? Perhaps as well, some within Jewish Christianity, as Jean Danielu has pointed out, were being baptized for those who were their righteous forebearers, uh, perhaps taking that action. In the Greek world, the way to explain the pre-Christian worthies was via the Logos that dwelt in all. Though Tertullian said, what concourse does Athens have with Jerusalem? The way to explain pre-Christian worthies in the Jewish world, Jewish Christian world, was oft times by way of God's having dealt with them in some way earlier and in some Jewish Christian groups even acting on their behalf. We don't know if that's what's going on at Corinth, but I think Margaret Thrall is quite right that something is going on there <laughs> that has to do with baptism for the dead and uh, Paul is making the point if indeed you are being baptized for the dead, why are you doing that? If indeed there is no resurrection of the dead, your action is belying your theory. Or again, he says, arguing in an ad hominem fashion, uh, if I have fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what good is it to me? Why do we endanger ourselves every hour? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. I think he's using a metaphor here. I know some have taken him very seriously and have tried to portray his actual fights with lions at Ephesus. Uh, but uh, I think he's talking metaphorically here. But the point is, if in my case I'm extending myself even to the point of death, why am I doing that if there is no resurrection? Uh, his point is made that uh, certainly I would be better off just to eat and drink and live for this life alone. He urges them not to be misled. He gives a little proverb, bad company corrupts good character, which seems to be saying something like, don't mix your Grecian ideas with the Christian proclamation here, but that's a very free translation. Uh, bad company corrupts good character. And he urges them to come back to their senses, which Robertson and Plummer suggest if these skeptics are indeed claiming to be sober thinkers and seeing um, resurrection as something of wild fantasy, he's urging them not to be drunk, but to come back to their senses. And so his verb is very much to the point. But what he is saying in this passage, especially in the apocalyptic section, is that all kinds of over-realized views of death and of Christian life over-realized eschatological views of how the Christian life goes on are to be set aside. We are not to be those who are thinking static ways. We are not to be those who think it all to be fulfilled here and now. We are to realize that God is dealing with us as he has with all humanity in a process and that we are in that process and that that process includes Christ the first fruits, and the coming of Christ, and the end, many other things, but those things are pertinent for his argument. And we are to see ourselves in that process. We are to see death and resurrection in the context of God's historical working. We are to have our hope in God, who is at work. And we are to rest in that confidence, even though we don't see it all taking place right now. He says something very similar to that in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. And it, since it's so very parallel, I want to read that. He's talking about present afflictions. He's talking about being a child of God. And if indeed a child entering into the whole experience of Christ suffering with him, for that's part of our inheritance now. 
But he says, I consider that our present sufferings, which includes everything within life that is grievous, including death, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. There is still bondage. There is still decay. There is still the reign of death. There is still all of that that has built up throughout history and we inherit. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Messianic travail is an image that is used in Judaism frequently. And as the pains of childbirth become sharper and sharper, one knows, of course, that soon there will be birth and there will be deliverance. We are experiencing pains of childbirth, Paul says, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who, are the, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as children, as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he has already has? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Our confidence is in a God who is promised. Our confidence is in a God who has acted in Jesus Christ redemptively for us, who has shown us and revealed to us in the death and resurrection of God that of our future as well. We don't see all that yet. We await it. We await with hope and expectation. So Paul would urge, don't expect all here and now. I heard once recently, I should say, a preacher who was giving statement to another, and I just was absolutely floored, where he told me, uh, told this other, that he came to this church, and it's a rather large church, he said, and for the fa past 15 years, they have never had any sickness, and they have had never had any funeral. I couldn't believe that. I wonder indeed if he is taking all his older people and shipping them out. Uh, I am wondering what's going to happen if he ever leaves that church and the next minister comes. He must have going to have an awful raft of hospital calls and funerals. Uh, I just was staggered. This man's living in some nether, never, never land. Uh, and yet he seemed to think that that was some great fulfillment of the gospel. And probably only as long as he stays there will that ever continue. Uh, I, just, I just didn't know how to answer that. He wants everything fulfilled right now, and he's quite sure that he's living in heaven, I suppose. Paul would suggest to him and would urge him and tell him quite directly, hope not in your full receiving of all that has now been promised. It, it's yet going to be coming. There's a progress. Hope in God who has a plan for the life and who has a program. And we are to see ourselves with those who are now with the first fruits. And we await yet final consummation. I don't know when the coming of Christ will come. I don't set times. It might be 800, 2,000 years from now. It might be tomorrow. <laughs> The Christian does hope for coming and for end. But my confidence in God is not on the basis that I know others who have escaped death. <laughs> my confidence in God is he has promised and there is one who has been raised from the dead. And that is Jesus Christ. And he is the first fruits. And I go on from there. In the next two nights, I'd like to develop it a little more, talking next time about how, talking about various views of resurrection, and then necessity, talking particularly about resurrection and immortality. 
Now, Mr. Chairman, I think I'm to turn it over to questions, am I?